thank you, uh, Rodney, for agreeing to have a chat with me this afternoon, uh, mainly about Pilgrim's Progress, which has been chosen for the 2023 second section area contest this year. Congratulations on that. You must be very pleased as well about that. Uh, but I thought we'd start off firstly to talk about your relationship with the fairy band, because mm -hmm. I know that goes back many years now. And uh, people might be wondering why fairies are doing your music in particular. But you know, and I know, uh, the special relationship that you've got and formed with fairies over the years. So would you mind just spending a few minutes telling people who maybe don't know how the relationship with WFEL Fairy Band came along? Yes, uh, it came through James Gourlay. Uh, when Jim was, um, a bit, was appointed to fairies, um, he was still with the Zurich Opera then. And uh, I had written a piece for him called Capriccio for Tuba Solo, which had been recorded. And uh, I was actually over with him in, in Switzerland at his place in, in Zurich when uh, he told me that he'd been appointed to uh, the fairy band. And he invited me to write a, a, a piece for the fairy band. I started out um, writing one movement and it grew into four and it became... Um, uh, Spanish Impressions, which were recorded for uh, for Shandos. We came up with the idea of doing Pilgrim's Progress, which had been chosen by that time as the second section area contest piece. And uh, we got the music and I was rehearsing the band. And I've got to say, as a piece of music, uh, and I know the band feel this, we really enjoyed rehearsing it because it, it was challenging, uh, which is always a, a factor when you're choosing for a, a top band like Fairies. Uh, it was very musical. It was very evocative uh, and it was fun. And, and that, that was the one thing we got from that music that we did. Now, it's not a modern piece. When I started reading and looking at it, it actually was written 20 years ago, uh, 20, 2003. Yeah. And it was a commission from uh, Dr. Stephen Cobb and the International Staff Band, as you right. alluded to. Did you, were you under any remit or influences it had to include for this? Or was it just a blank canvas? None whatsoever. Um, Phil... Uh, it's not Phil, Stephen Cobb, excuse me, uh, Dr. Stephen Cobb and I were chatting at the British Open and he said to me, I think you ought to write uh, a piece for the ISB. I thought, well, I'm not a Salvationist, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. I said, well, will they mind? The Salvation Army mind a Catholic writing a piece for their top brass band. He said, oh, don't worry, he said. We, we, we had Vaughan Williams, he wasn't even a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I had to decide to, he gave me no no brief whatsoever. He just let me get on with it. He wasn't even sure if I was going to do it. It wasn't really a commission. There was no money involved. I just decided it was something I would like to do. Well, my mind went back to the very, very first time I encountered a brass band, which was in the, I suppose it must have been the late 50s, I think, early 60s. The Salvation Army Band had invited me to a rehearsal because they were doing Eric Ball's The Kingdom Triumphant, so we started off with a big timpani role, and their timpanist was taken ill, and they needed somebody to fill in for the rehearsal. So I was involved. I wasn't involved with the Salvation Army at all. It was through, uh, through a neighbour of mine I got involved with this. That was the first time I'd heard a brass band, and Eric Ball's music was the first music I heard. It absolutely blew me away. I thought, this is marvellous. I had no idea what those brass instruments were in front of me, all these tubers and horns and baritones. Some years later, I became a choir master in Birmingham, and I discovered um, through Salvation Army literature a tune by Eric Ball that I thought was marvellous. It was a setting of the Pilgrim Sim from Pilgrim's Practice from his cantata, Way of a Pilgrim. And I tried it out with my choir. I thought, this is terrific stuff. It was uh, sort of written in the style of Vaughan Williams, my great hero. And um, a wonderful, sturdy, modal, uh, Dorian mode tune. And I thought, and my mind went back to this. And Eric Ball Centenary was coming up. And I thought, right, I'll do a set of variations on that tune. And I'll base the whole piece on the story of the film's progress, which will be... Um, doctrinally acceptable to the Salvation Army. That's something we can both uh, um, uh, accept uh, and understand. And um, it will be in the nature of a tribute to Eric in his centenary year. My, my only disappointment was he wasn't alive to hear it. I wonder what he thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> but he is hearing it somewhere up there. You Possibly. Know. Possibly. 
that's I mean, how it came about. It, well, that's well. There you go. I mean, it was never intended to be a contest piece, was it? No, 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 no. Uh, I, I think from reading some of your notes as well, the way you wrote the piece, uh, which is very descriptive, uh, and there's a clear line of, of story from the the start to the finish and the transformation of the uh, the characters in the in the middle. Um, as you alluded to, there were no technical demands, and you could write that piece or this piece, sorry, Pilgrim's Progress, in uh, to whatever le level of difficulty you felt you needed to. And uh, and the recording of the staff band, and certainly we found that with fairies, it does make a lot of demands on certain players. Oh, it does. Yes. Well, I was, I was writing people like um, Derek Kane, you know, and Kevin Ashman, uh, Mike Callender, uh, and uh, obviously I, I I knew they could play anything that I wrote. So I did. <laughs> so I wrote anything for them. <laughs> One of the things that I noted in your Brass Band World article was uh, you, you talked about the tempos. As a conductor, I was looking at the tempo marks. And there's yeah. tempo marks and just general Italian terms. Yeah. Lento Mysterioso, and then it was Mark Crotchet equals 86. Now, I, I think I interpreted that a lot slower than was marked on the score. Uh, would you mind that? <laughs> I don't mind in the least. They can do with it what they like. Obviously, I, I, the um, the tempo markings were there for a championship uh, uh, section standard band. Uh -huh. um, some of them may be... It, I, I'm more interested in clarity yes. and in movement. In the faster sections, it should never be a scramble, an unholy mess, just for the sake of uh, the fact of, uh, of obeying the tempo markings. So I, I got that. Not, that that's, they're not sacrosanct. That's one of that's one of your quotes. Actually, I've written this yes. down. Clarity rather than unholy scramble. Yes, that's right. And, and the slow sections, the music should never go to sleep. No. It's like um, the music of my great idol Vaughan Williams. Some conductors take it very reverentially and rather too slowly. But if you listen to the great Sir Adrian Bolt doing it, who was his great friend, he always keeps him on the move all the time. Delia, uh, Sir Thomas Beecham said of the music of Delius, don't ever let old Fred's music go to sleep. Keep yeah. him moving all the time. Otherwise, he just gets turgid yeah. and, and boring. I think you've got to find the right tempo that suits yeah. the players you, you're right. performing with. It's a test for the conductor as much as it is for the band, I think. Very much. Uh, I would say. Could you tell us... In your own words, uh, Rodney, uh, about the storyline of the piece. It starts off with the Pilgrim's Hymn, and then it, there's, there's eight variations. And the first variation is the City of Destruction. That's right. Well, this this is um, I've, I've basically followed the um, the story of uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Obviously, missing out a great deal of this, but we start out with a, with a, a character not called Christian. He's called Graceless. And he's living in this place called the City of Destruction, which shouldn't seem a million miles away from uh, London or Manchester or Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's rushing around, trying to make a, a fast buck, treading on each other, and he just, and he, Graceless cries, what, uh, what must I do to be saved? And you can hear that on the, on the, the, end. On the brass at the end. What must I do? What must I do? What must I do to be saved? Answered by um, a number of suspension uh, yeah. in the in, in the, uh, the lower band, and then we go into the first um, uh, variation uh, at the cross where he loses. He, he's got a great big pack of sin on his back, you see. Yeah. And um, which is very, very much a Salvation Army piece uh, at this point. Uh, he's by in in the story by a character called um, Evangelist, he's directed to the cross where he kneels at the cross and his burden of sin falls off. And in the terms of the Salvation Army, he gets saved. Correct. Correct. And then he changes his name to Christian, and that's the big that is the big um, that is the big uh, turning point, the pivotal point at the beginning of this piece. The whole thing changes from there. In the moment where the burden of sin falls off. I, I, there's a sudden change of, of harmony. That should sound special. I wish the um, I'd ask the uh, ISP to make a little more about passing because that is very important. That is the big. As I've just said that is the big pivotal point where the story suddenly changes and we, we're off. off we are now at last off on the pilgrimage. Our characters has changed his name to Christian, yep. and he goes off in the next variation, full of um, to find. The celestial city, which is which is the this is variation three, the king's highway. 
That's right. Which so he's looking for the he's looking for the celestial city, which no doubt we'll, we'll, we should all end up, Mark. You know, we'll, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> um, and that's a, that, that's a very jaunty and lively Mark. Yes, that's right. he's, full, he's full of confidence. You see, yes. Yes. Um, he's, he, he's he's found his his faith, and he's absolutely full of confidence. He's stepping out in, in and each time it changes key, and more instruments are added. So, yeah. so he's really he's really buoyed he's really buoyed up by the time he encounters his first huge obstacle, which is the next variation, which is Apollyon. Yes, Christian fights Apollyon. That's right. Now Apollyon um, is this, this horrible monster who announces that he's the lord of the city of destruction, and that uh, Christian must give up this stupid um, quest for the celestial city and return to him, and uh, all will be well. Well, Christian doesn't think much of that, so he. Uh, he, he decides to fight him, and I based the uh, the music on um, Wagner's dragon music from Siegfried. Yes, and, uh, Das Rango. I just wonder how many E flat bass players might want to fight you instead of Apollyon after this. Well, quite a few. I think I think I think I have to buy. I have to keep a low profile if I attend any conference. <laughs> I'm going to have to buy a few pints. I think. That's going to cause a few headaches. That's going well, to cause it, a few headaches. It, it, it's setting the bar very high for the second yeah. section. Yeah, I is. think possibly this may have been in the um, selection panel's mind. They wanted to increase the standard. If you can play this piece, you're, you're almost ready to go into the next section. Why not? Why so not? It, it's, it's not mollycoddling the bands. It's giving not them something they have to work at. Very much so. And then variation five. Uh, very Now, this was very strange rehearsing this because we were thinking... How the heck does this music transfer? Why is it in the middle? It's variation five, Vanity Fair. That's right. Well, he, he uh, after his battle with Apollyon, he comes across this. He's exhausted, of course, and he and, he and his his mate uh, come across this um, this uh, this place called where they hear the sound of merrymaking, and it's um, a fair is in progress. It's called it's called Vanity Fair, which all sorts of things are on display on offer. Of course, the whole thing is an allegory. Remember. And uh, this is the um, the place of worldly temptations, and uh, unfortunately, it's not run by people who have um, our hero's best interests at heart. It's run by Lord Beelzebub and Lord Hategood. So you can imagine what those two chaps are like. They offer him all manner of distractions and temptations, and then he meets two ladies called Madame Wanton and Madame Bubble, oh. who um, seek to uh, seek to uh, well, <laughs> they seek to seduce him. And of course, he's, he's, he realises that this, this, this is not the place for him. So he, uh, particularly in, in the story, as the as as friend uh, who is with him, I think he's faithful, I think, he, he, he sees him being burnt as a heretic at the stake. And he, he runs away, you can hear him run away in the band, yeah. and uh, particularly that downward scale on, on the soprano chordy, which is a so-and-so to play. Yes. Um, you'll, need a, need, you'll need a shulker to play that. <laughs> <laughs> And um, he, he goes slap bang then into the clasp of giant despair. Yes. In Doubting Castle. Now, um, I, I am of the opinion that Bunyan knew everything all uh, uh, was uh, uh, intimately acquainted. I'll say that again. I'm, I'm of the opinion that he was intimately acquainted with uh, depression because he had to spend 12 years in prison separated from his family for the heinous sin of preaching without a license and they even offered him a pardon and he said no he said uh, if he would uh, agree not to preach not not to continue preaching because he was an itinerant preacher he wasn't a minister he was a tinker right for an educated man who taught himself and uh, he's putting himself at great risk and they took these they took the religion very seriously in those days mm. the days of uh, you know the Puritans, and they were very, very, very strict. And only people who were licensed, or not ordained ministers, could preach. It's, but he it, wasn't licensed. It, it is a very. I agree with that totally, Rodney, because it's a very dark section. But oh yes. A beautiful melody, melody line with the flugel and the solo horn interweaves. Yeah. Well, it's, it's melancholy, you see. And yeah. he, he's, uh, he's he's in depression. Anybody who's suffered depression would understand what that is like. And I'm sure John Bunyan did, because he does write a number of times about the, about the states of depression. Right. Uh, but he got himself out. He, he was released from prison in the end, 
And our hero is released because he finds a key of promise in his pocket and he tries to in the locks and all the locks spring open and he's free. And it's into then the variation of seven of the delectable mountains. Right, Shepherd Shepherd Death. We, we Shepherd pop- Death takes him over the mountains and he can see the celestial city at That's last. That's right. The, um, he, he, we fast forward now to the end of the story. His quest is n- for the celestial city is merely at, um, at, at an end. He, he's, uh, he's undergone a number of uh, pitfalls and, and met, met a number of people who tried to distract him. Some tried to help him. And uh, he eventually ends up in this place called the Delectable Mountains, where there are some shepherds there. And they have a telescope. And they say, look, if you look through it, you can actually see the celestial city in the distance. So he does not know he can see the celestial city. But to get there, he has to find, uh, to go through one final enormous hurdle, he has to cross the River of Death. Yes. And uh, so the, the what I do with the Celestial City is I take the um, variation um, three and I slow it down. And yes. Pastoral music, you see. Right. So we used to have uh, the um, the King's Highway with yum, ba da 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 you see. But yes. Yeah. He's, he's, yes. he's, he's, now, he's now, I suppose, he's an old man now, and he, yes. but he, he has to go through this final um, herd of the river of death, and I, I depict this by these surging um, semi-quavers. And a, fi- and a five four and a five four time signature and the the, the, right. the holes yeah. and the cornets the baritones have this semi quaver work. That's right. It's five right. in four. It's it's um it, it, it's it's it kind of pushes him um from one side to another. He finds it difficult to keep a foothold, and you can hear I I, I what I'm trying to do is to describe him trying to keep his head above water with the tune in the at the top of the band and the tune in the bottom of the band as he tries to keep his foothold. Very and clever. in fact, um, uh, Bunyan says he starts to panic because the waves are coming over his head. But he eventually makes the other side in in, um, in safety and um, the trumpeters of the Celestial City, or rather I think the solo cornets and trombones, come out to meet him. And uh, they fanfares and the bells ring out and uh, he's home and dry, he's, he's, he's reached the Celestial City. But uh, Bunyan then uh, puts a, uh, an epilogue when he, mm. uh, into his, his, his allegory, his dream, in the, sorry, an allegory in, in the shape of a dream, and he uh, uh, commends his book to um, uh, his readers. So I put a final coda in, in which I commend Eric Ball's theme to my listeners by playing it in its original form and the piece ends with uh, a couple of uh, octaves um i suppose it's the word pilgrim uh, um from, from the full band very decisively and yeah. so that's my kind of uh, epilogue to it so that's the whole thing of the pilgrim's progress wonderful i mean that that's such a great description of, of a, a great piece of music that I have no doubt uh, all players and conductors and audience will enjoy in the next coming months throughout the country. Um, it, it's a, it's, it was a pleasure to conduct it and rehearse it. And uh, I, I, on behalf of WFEL Fairy Band, thanks for your time once again to My reminisce pleasure. and uh, talk about... I could talk all day, Rodney, and they'd never get bored. And we, <laughs> oh, we could, couldn't we? <laughs> we could easily. And 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 just on behalf of the fair band, thank you for the, the time again and the relationship we do have. Oh, and I'd say to all the second section bands out there, good luck and enjoy what is a tremendous piece of music. And uh, if anyone wants Rodney's phone number, I will pass it on, especially if you're an E-flat bass player. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs>